Hey there, John here. In today's video, we're going to finish going through all of the entries in the AI Tweakers section. We've already covered a lot of ground in the first couple of videos on this. Let's finish up with this one. First up is the DigiPlus BRM. You're going to see VDDCR in a whole bunch of spots. This is a SUSE's term for V-Core, or voltage that is reaching the actual cores of the CPU. VDD, from what I can gather, means voltage from the supply drain, which is the positive voltage that is entering the core. There are several sources of power coming into the motherboard. In addition to VDD, there can be VSS, which stands for source supply, VEE, which means emitter supply, and VCC, which is collector supply. My limited understanding is that these power sources provide powers to different types of components on the motherboard. I am presuming then that VDDCR represents the voltage from the drain supply at the CR or core. First up on here is the CPU lo load line calibration. Load line calibration or LLC is used to ensure that the CPU is getting enough voltage during load increases while not continuously providing overvolting. The purpose of LLC is to stabilize core voltage under heavy CPU loads. CPU current capability. This appears to allow you to make sure that sufficient current is supplied so that you do not run into overclocking limitations. Next up is switching frequency. A VRM is a voltage regulator module, and every motherboard has a number of these. The VRMs take the 12 volt power from the power supply and convert it down to the voltage needed by the CPU and SOC. Having a number of VRMs allows the components to get a stable power input rather than one that could fluctuate, which could cause instability. Switching frequency here allows the system to change the transient response of the VRMs. Higher transient response will translate into more stable voltages for the CPU and the SOC. However, higher frequencies come at the cost of increased heat and VRMs already get pretty hot under normal operating conditions. Next up is CPU power phase control. Greater stability for overclocking by making sure that the power phases coming from the VRMs are focused on the CPU. The trade-off is that there's less power phases on the other components and increased power consumption. They have power duty control, which can increase the current to the CPU voltage regulator, giving more stable overclocking. Again, at the cost of more heat and more power consumption. Next, you're going to see the same items of load line calibration, current capability, switching frequency, and power phrase control, but this time for the SOC rather than the uh, CPU. Next up is the VDD-CR CPU voltage. This is the actual voltage that's going into the uh, core. We're showing 1.28 volts here, and if you look at the hardware monitor, you see the 1.28, although now it's switched down to 1.264, back to 1.28. Uh, that's the actual voltage that's getting to the core. Um, so you can change this, um, and this is, you know, the basic base of overclocking is increasing the voltage to allow the processor to run faster. Uh, obviously, that comes at risks uh, of damaging your component. It could also come with uh, higher power consumption, higher heat. All of that has to be managed. Those are the fine lines that the overclockers have to balance when trying to get the optimal performance out of their systems. Next, you have the VDDCR SOC voltage. This is the amount of voltage being fed to the SOC, which is responsible for the memory controller. Next up is the DRAM voltage. We saw this on the DOCP or the direct overclock profile. Uh, when this was set, the settings provided and required 1.35 volts to go to the DRAM, and that's why you see the 1.35 volts here, but the user can manually change the voltage going to the DRAM. Next, we got the VDDG CCD voltage control. This supplies voltage to the infinity fabric and you would adjust this to provide additional stability to the F-clock, which is controlled by the Infinity Fabric. CCD supplies voltage for the Infinity Fabric links uh, between any CCXs that would be on a CCD. 
Then you got the VDDG IOD voltage control. This also supplies voltage to the Infinity Fabric. IOD supplies voltage for the Infinity Fabric link between the IO die and the CCD. And then you got the CLDO VDDP voltage. Not really sure what the C represents, but LDO stands for low dropout level. This is the voltage for the DDR4 on the SOC. This component converts information from the memory controllers to a format that the DDR modules can understand. The next items here are voltages that are available to the CPU package. There's a 1.05 voltage. Um, SB stands for Southbridge. Uh, and it is the portion of the chipset that controls things like the BIOS, USB, and other low-speed components. This is the 1.05 voltage source. Uh, you have a very minimal amount that you can adjust this between 1.05 and 1.1, basically two settings. Same, things with the, same thing with the 2.5 voltage. It could either be 2.5 or 2.55 on this system. And then you have the CPU 1.8 voltage. This is the amount of voltage that's available uh, to the CPU. Um, Again, we only got 1.28, but voltage gets supplied to other parts of the uh, uh, CPU as well. And this, my understanding is, just provides what the headroom is to make sure that you have stable power available to be fed to the CPU. Next, we have the VTT DDR voltage. This is the voltage used to control the impedance of the bus in order to achieve high speed and maintain signal integrity. Then we have the VPP MEM voltage, which is this voltage determines how reliably a DRAM row gets accessed. Obviously, the more voltage, uh, the more reliable and the stronger the signal is. Then you got the VDDP standby voltage. This is the voltage for the transistor that sets the memory contents. And then the last two items are CPU core current telemetry and CPU SOC current telemetry. The processor will read the current being supplied to the core and the SOC. These settings allow the user to offset the amount that the processor quote unquote sees. If it is adjusted downward, it may add boost frequencies because the processor is not quote unquote reading the full amount of power being supplied. So essentially you're cheating the system by having it read a number lower than is actually being fed to it. And again, this could allow you to get the uh, higher performance from the system uh, at the trade-off of potential instability or potential damage to the components, more heat, more power, all the standard things that overclockers have to contend with. Uh, one more thing I just want to add is SOC is basically stands for system on chip. Um, that's AMD's term for all of the components outside of the actual cores that are on the CPU. Uh, Intel uses the phrase uncore for the same components. Uh, so I just want to make sure that uh, that was spelled out. So you have the cores that are actually doing all of the computing work, and then you have all of the other interconnected pieces that are on the CPU. Uh, that's all part of the SOC or the system on chip. Uh, so that wraps it up for the AI tweaker section. Next up will be the advanced section. We've seen here on the AI tweaker, uh, this is really the wheelhouse for overclockers and for them to be able to be able to try to uh, fine tune and optimize their system for performance. There are some settings in the advanced section that also get used by overclockers, but there's also lots of other items uh, that are not directly related to overclocking that we'll go over. So hopefully the information continues to be useful. Uh, we will continue grinding through all of the entries on this BIOS, and uh, uh, please stay tuned. Wow. We covered a lot of ground in these last three videos. Uh, AI Tweaker is clearly the purview of overclockers uh, given the uh, boatload of settings that uh, are available for uh, adjustment. There are numerous sources for overclocking on YouTube and on the internet. Um, I just want everybody to remember I'm not trying to show you how to overclock, although we are going to try to get into doing some overclocking in future videos. No, my purpose is if you are interested in overclocking, I think uh, 
a good foundation is actually understanding what all of the settings are and what they mean so that when you are getting into changing them or if you're following a guide on uh, suggestions on what to do about overclocking, you have a better understanding of what changes you're actually making and how it affects the entire system. So I hope that you're finding these videos helpful and informative. If you are, please consider liking and subscribing. I hope to see you on the next one.